you know, a good question to start is um, that it's certainly my impression um, that the question of the meaning of life, or as I said, it's more modern, modest variant meaning in life is, is kind of back on the map. So for example, there was a, a handbook, I can't remember if it was Oxford Routledge or Blackwell's called the, say, um, Routledge Handbook of the Philosophy of Meaning in Life, um, published a year or two ago, containing an essay by you and about 65 other scholars. So it gave me a sense of the breadth of engagement in these questions. So I was just wondering if you could give the viewers a little bit of a, an overview of, of this, the lie of the land, so to speak, why, why this question has returned to philosophy after a period where I had the impression it was considered a little bit outdated or kind of impossible to answer or not even worth inquiring about. Well, I mean, I don't know why people gave up on answering something so important. Uh, I think that was a big mistake. Um, I think part of it was that the end, the question is more than one question because there's different kinds of meaning and meaning can mean different things. And so, but you would think that that analytic philosophy is particularly suited to making those distinctions and sorting things out. Um, but that has, I think, still not happened. And that is something that I intend to do. I do a little bit in this in the paper that was published, and I intend to do it in my book. And I can talk to you now about some of the distinctions um, that I see. Um, if we're talking about the term meaning, it can mean explanation, impact, value, significance, purpose, which is the reason for which something is done, and point, which is the valued end of, of whatever you're doing. So those are sort of uh, six characteristics that meaning can have. So that already gives you a lot of messiness in the discussion because most people who talk about it, even now, are not specifying which meaning of meaning they're talking about. And so that can make the whole topic seem very confused and lead analytic philosophers to throw up their hands and walk away from it. Again, big mistake. Um, the kinds of meaning, I think there are three kinds. Uh, there is um, what I call ultimate meaning, which is the point or the valued end of leading a life at all, meaning of life. I think that is an answerable question, very sad answer, separate from meaning in life, I guess, which I would call everyday meaning. Everyday meaning is the meaning your life can have. It can have explanation by being coherent. You can have an impact on the world and it, that includes, so that's part of your everyday meaning. The impact can be good or bad. So a person's life can have negative meaning like, like Hitler's life, which wasn't meaningless. That would be silly to say, but it had a bad meaning, bad in, impact. Um, value, so engaging with valuable things makes your everyday life meaningful. And then you can argue about if it needs to be objective value, subjective value, but value, unless you're a nihilist, which I don't think anybody actually is. Um, and then uh, you can think about the significance of your everyday life, uh, how, how much of a mark you're making or how value, uh, you know, and then the purpose. Uh, you have various purposes in your everyday life. You do things for reasons. You have children because you want to love them, let's say, or because you want them to work on your farm. Worse reason, but still a reason. And you have within your life points to the things that you do. Valued ends, you pursue, let's say you protest or you become a civil rights lawyer because justice is a valued end within your life. So that's everyday meaning as opposed to ultimate meaning, which is something else that I think applies to the separate project you have of running your life. And you're wondering, what's the point of that? You can't have one. That's very sad. Um, and then cosmic meaning would be the the meaning that we have based on our role in the cosmos, be that supernatural or natural. Maybe we're special beings. Maybe we're the only beings that have um, moral agency. Maybe we're food for the gods. Maybe we're participating in God's plan. That's cosmic meaning. So those are the three kinds of meaning, ultimate cosmic and everyday. And then there are six characteristics of meaning you can have within these kinds. And if you set that out, even though it's a little bit like sorting your laundry, then you can have a real analytic conversation about it. And then the questions you ask are not nebulous. And a lot of them do have answers. Thank you. That, that was very thorough. So one of the classic answers, um, not a very serious one, but I suppose not entirely unserious, depending on what kind of aspiration you have for the, the answer would be from Monty Python. Um, so their answer to the meaning of life in the movie of that name is um, try and be nice to people, avoid eating fat, read a good book every now and then, get some walking in and try to live together in peace and harmony with people of all 
creeds and nations. So I suppose, according to your taxonomy, that would be um, everyday meaning. Yes, it would and be everyday meaning. They are fo focusing on purpose as the kind of subset of everyday meaning, or would it be another part? Uh, of I that? think that, that getting along with people is thinking about um, having an impact, having significance. That could be one of your purposes. Reading a book could be because you value knowledge, and that could be a, a purpose, a value. Maybe it has an impact. So I think that whole discussion, that whole Monty Python, uh, is a you know um, sort of prescription is a way of having some meaning in your life. But it is not. It doesn't give you a reason to live at all. Why bother with the mm -hmm. whole thing? That I don't think that gives you. It's just as well, like, you know, you're helping other people. Wouldn't it be just as well if there were no people and you weren't like the whole cycle of suffering and alleviating suffering is a pointless cycle. You don't need to do any of it. It's not going to give you a point to leading your whole life um, based on the argument that I provide in my paper. But that, but the Monty Python thing is talking about everyday meaning, I think. Um, and it's certainly not contrary to everyday meaning. I don't know if it's the best prescription for everyday meaning, but what they're saying is consistent with everyday meaning. I mean, do you, I suppose the the sort of subtext or not even subtext, maybe the obvious text of what they're saying is don't take this question too seriously. There's almost inherent in the answer. and Maybe it's a sort of theme in a lot of their things is a certain kind of awkwardness or even disgust at any attempts to offer sort of strongly moralizing pictures of how we should live our lives. I mean, do you find that within contemporary analytic philosophy that's approaching these questions they're trying to do Monty Python style answers in other words try to get together um, what what they consider to be as rigorous a possible list of things that would overall amount to the most possible meaning one could have in one's life or do you see their goals as different to that I think so I think Monty Python was not saying not to take it seriously they were giving up on meaning of life and making sort of unsophisticated but not incorrect uh prescriptions for meaning in life I think within um and I think again I say I think it's wrong to give up on the question of meaning on life it's just you have to face the sadness of the answer um I think that in contemporary analytic philosophy you have such a hodgepodge of approaches some people are talking about cosmic meaning. Some people will actually say they're talking about cosmic meaning, but other times they're just talking about it without saying they're talking about it. You know, um, and some people are talking about ultimate meaning. Nozick talks about, you know, you're the meaning of your whole life. Nagel talks about the meaning of your whole life. These are analytic philosophers. I mean, Nozick is a great example. Uh, in his, he has like a hundred pages of his um, moral ex explanations, uh, philosophical explanations book. Uh, most people read like thirty because there's one little chapter on meaning, but it's really like the last hundred pages where he's using all the terms of meaning interchangeably. It's a, but it is still a fascinating and valuable discussion. But I don't think you can say that contemporary analytic philosophy has focused on any one of the questions because they still didn't separate them all out. Mostly though, I think you're right that analytic philosophy has spoken much less about meaning of life and has focused more on meaning in life because it is uh, a more understandable question and a more optimistic answer. And it's a more understandable question because when you say ultimate meaning or the point, you have to really think about what that means. And I define point as a valued end. And that is a starting point to think about what the point is and to think about whether life can have this overall point in general. You know, the point of leading and living your life as this thing that you do, as the meta project, separate from the things mm -hmm. you do within your life. That's that's really useful. I think in my head, I would have probably thought that ultimate meaning and cosmic meaning were roughly the same. Yeah. Like often when people refer to ultimate, they tend to mean something like cosmic or religious. But what I mean, you've you've touched on it already um, in the sense that ultimate meaning is the kind of meta project of meaning, the meaning of one's life as a whole. Could you clarify for, for people so that we can move mm -hmm. kind of on the structure of your argument that there's the scope of ultimate meaning as as you want to um, account for it and why you think it's the most important kind of meaning there is. I don't know that it's, well, so, so, so let's just, let me just say, start by saying what it is. So as opposed to cosmic and everyday meaning, which can, you can talk about the other characteristics like explanation, impact, value, significant purpose, ultimate meaning is just about point. And it is about the point of 
leading your life as a whole, which I think that most agents do, most people do. I don't think, I think most animals do not, even if they're intelligent animals, they're not sort of run, you know, if you think of your, it, you, some people do this more than others. Some people have a life plan and a life project, but ever, anyone who plans for the future, who thinks about how the past fits into their present, their present and the future, who thinks about the shape of their life, why they're living, the legacy they're gonna leave, any, that's leading a human agential life, running your life. And that I think is an effort or a project of its own. You know, even if you, so, you know, you, you're making choices. Should you get married or not? Should you take a hard job or an easy job? Should you raise chickens or children? And those are things that you do. And those are decisions you make. You don't just do whatever. If you're doing whatever, you're living like a lower animal and you you don't have ultimate meaning. And you're also not living up to your human potential, <laughs> Let's, which is an everyday meaning problem. But ultimate meaning means the, the, re, the point of doing all of it. Why are you leading a life? running a life that is which i think people do as a project of its own that project has nowhere to reach for a point because all the points are in it um which i can explain if you want uh um but that's but just to answer your question about ultimate meaning that's what i think distinguishes ultimate meaning from the other kinds of meaning and it does not have to be cosmic the, if you had a point to your life as a whole there's no reason it would have to be a cosmic point and you could have a cosmic point a reason you know your role in the cosmos could be to provide food for the gods or i don't know shine a bright light somewhere or whatever and that would still not give you a reason for living for running your life it could give you a cosmic point but not an ultimate point thank you so <clears throat> there's various parts to your argument i guess we've discussed ultimate meaning what it is um the next part is why we don't have it and, and can't get it. So I thought we'd start off by situating it within the field of philosophy. So you describe ultimate meaning as a metaphysical impossibility. So could we start with the first word? Why, why is it specifically a, um, a metaphysical question as opposed to say a conceptual question? It could be the kind of thing where you say the idea of ultimate meaning just doesn't make sense which may also be a metaphysical question but i think it does make sense I, I call it a metaphysical problem because it is based on the nature of things it's the nature of points and the nature of values and the nature of what an ultimate meaning what your life and your life that makes it impossible for you to have this kind of meaning so i'll elaborate the nature of a, of a point a point is a valued end and valued ends, and this is metaphysical, lie outside the projects or the activities that they're grounded by or that or that they're aiming at. So if you're playing with your kids, the act is the playing. The value that is grounding or that you're aiming at is the intimacy or to express your love. That's not in the act, that's outside the act. Values are always outside the act. An act is just the act. It has to reach outside of it for a point, for this valued end. So Valued ends are not within the projects, they're not within the efforts, they lie separate. That's sort of a metaphysical fact about points and values. Now, the next metaphysical fact is about your life, leading your life. It includes everything in it. So there's, it has nowhere to reach outside of it for a point. So if you're working towards justice, well, you care about justice, that's why you give it this place in your life, within your life project. And so you have a reason to pursue justice. But then you say, but why am I leading my life at all? I can't say it's for the justice because that's outside of it metaphysically. And also practically, you can think about it. What if you, at some point you're gonna achieve justice, it's enough. Otherwise you're just being nitpicky and annoying and everybody has to have the exact same ounces of cake, right? And so, and then what's the point of the rest of your life? And that allows you to see that the justice is in your life. It doesn't lie outside of it. And so you're, you're and, it, and so you're, so it can't serve as a point for leading your life because points are valued ends. Value, valued ends lie outside the projects or the efforts. And that is why metaphysically, based on the nature of values and the nature of points and the nature of life, that it includes its entirety, it is metaphysically impossible to have ultimate meaning. Okay, um, I'm sure there's plenty of um, people trying to work through all that. So I'll try and do my best to break down some of the points. And then obviously, if anyone wants to pick up any in the, the Q&A, that would be um, great. So I suppose just the first thing that comes to mind is, um, well, for example, you're talking about, say, um, playing with your kids, and there may certainly be, be, be certain things that according to the philosophical distinction between instrumental and intrinsic values would seem like you're doing it 
say say for example something you don't enjoy doing like changing diapers that's an instrument you, you value it instrumentally as a means to sort of keep your kid healthy or whatever but then there would be other aspects of being with your child such as um playing with them or um teaching them that i think people would would see as intrinsic value something where where effectively the the goal of them is contained within the action itself as i see it that's a distinction that you don't sort of take as a, a very clear-cut distinction but do you still recognize it to some degree in your I, model? Completely, I completely recognize the difference between an intrinsic value but an intrinsic value still lies outside of the act so you're playing with your children because you love them it's not like milking a cow for the milk so you're playing you value your children and you're playing with them, you value intimacy, you value the love. These are all the reasons why you're doing this act, why you're stacking blocks with them, which is boring, but you're doing it. Um, and uh, that in and, and the so and the value is achieved while you're doing it. it doesn't have to be after, like you milk the cow and then you have the milk. Uh, and it is based on an intrinsic value, but the value doesn't lie within the act itself. The act is just stacking blocks. It has to reach outside of the act for this value of intimacy, which is not an act is an act. A value is a value. The fact that you're achieving the value and the act at the same time doesn't sort of mash the act right into the value. They're still separate. Um, even the and of course, if you want to have a point or a valued end, it's you're gonna you're gonna look for intrinsic value. Uh, that's what a real value is. You keep going until you get to something, you know, that sort of base level, intrinsic value for its own sake. You value your grandmother for her own sake. That's why you visit her. Um, and you, she's not an instrument to anything. You're visiting her because you love her. But the visit is the act. The value is outside of it, even if it's an intrinsic value. And I also okay. in in the article in the there there's a, some responses to the in the second the next issue of the Journal of Controversial Ideas I have there's objections and I have a reply and one of them is to this exact question where I further clarify that I'm not saying that there's no such thing as intrinsic value at all it's just it's not within the act. Okay, so um, one one small question I had in in relation to that is. Um, this idea of making sense of our lives as a whole. So, um, I mean, in the essay at one point, you talk about um, the aspiration to make sense of our lives as a whole as being rooted in our having a narrative identity. So to use like a book as a metaphor, could not the entire um, meaning of our life as a whole um, finally finish on the final word of the, the final page? And that would in itself then be a, a whole story with a, a narrative arc up to and including, for example, a peaceful, painless death surrounded by your loved ones and some noble final words, for example. Would, would that not be the same as um, the story of your life as a whole? Um, yeah, so thank you for asking that because I wanted to clarify, and I think I have a footnote in the paper, but that I don't, that narrative value is not the same thing as what I'm, it's one aspect of leading your life. Um, but we can still ask, for example, why are you writing the whole story, right? So when I say that you, that you run your life as an effort of its own, it's not that, so it's that running your life is this project or enterprise that you do. You don't just live, you lead your life. Um, in leading your life, some argue you have this narrative value and narrative meaning, which I think helps explain it, but it's not necessary for it. If I don't believe or care about narrative value, I can still have my same argument, which is that you lead your life, you're running your life. Why are you doing it? So even if you write this whole story of your life with this beautiful ending, why'd you write the story? It was a lot of work. Why'd you do it? Right? So it still doesn't answer that question. I mean, presumably people could give answers to that question, though. They could say, um, I lived my life in the service of, you know, like the kind of thing people write in their autobiographies. I, I lived a life in the service of knowledge and truth and, and justice. And this is the story of how I managed to um, to fulfill that that kind That's of meaning, ultimate. Yeah. But it's not ultimate. That is meaning within your life. Because you value justice, because you value other people, you gave them place in your life. 
but it is not the meaning of running your life as a whole. Why bother with that? You can see that when you look at those values. If you say, I try to alleviate suffering. Well, at some point, it's good enough, right? Well, the, I try to make the world better for, for, for future generations. Okay, what happens when you do that already? At some point, it's good enough. Otherwise, we're just each one generation indentured to the next. What's the point of it? Uh, if you want to alleviate suffering, do you want there always to be suffering? I thought suffering is what you don't want, right? What happens when all the people are helped? Then you're left to see, oh, I actually have nothing, no reason to, it's not, I have no reason, nothing outside my life to serve as a reason for running it because the justice, the other people, they're all within it. So the example you just gave are of somebody who explained why their life has everyday meaning. They lived consistent with their values. They had everyday meaning and purpose, but it would, but there's still, why do you bother living at all, right? And you, so one example that I give in my paper is, you know, if you're, if the point of your life is to eat these tomatoes and you put them really far away, you might not notice that it's not an ultimate answer because you never get to the tomatoes. But what happens if they're like in the next room, you eat the tomatoes and you're like, now what? What's the point of the rest of my life? And that shows you that anything within your life cannot serve as a reason or a point for this meta project of living it just like because it's just like any other project. The value has to lie outside of it. But with, once you're living, everything that all your values are right in your life and can serve to do that. Thank you. So I suppose one one question I have would be um, if, if someone has a I mean, obviously, that there is the, the fact that people have intuition, some people more than others, some at different times of their life that um, life is pointless. They, they may just sometimes say it on a bad day or they may, they may feel that to some degree, um, every time they, they try to sort of build up enough everyday meaning, it still falls short. Um, do you think that when people come to that conclusion, they are sort of tapping in, intuitively into what you're trying to say? Or do you think they're talking about something different? Like it could just be that they've had a bad day and they got their book deal rejected. So they say, oh, life is pointless. But in fact, what they mean is this everyday source of meaning is pointless. I mean, do, do you feel because your argument's quite technical and abstract, do you think it nonetheless speaks to what a lot of people mean when they have this intuition that there's something missing or that there's a lack of point in their lives? Yes, but I think it's most clearly seen when your life is full of everyday meaning. And this is actually what spurred me to write this and to think about this. It's like, my, right, I have this great job. I still, uh, you know, I've married a long time. I love my husband, my kids. My life is full of meaning. And I just think all day long, it's pointless anyway. Pointless, pointless, pointless. Um, so I think that um, distinguishing between everyday meaning and ultimate meaning um, can allow, make sense of a lot of feelings people have, which is like, oh, why bother with the whole thing? But you still get upset if if you if you break your leg and you still get excited when your kid paints a nice picture for you. Um, and though because those are everyday meaning things that make your life meaningful, but you still have this sort of hovering worry in the background, like, oh, what's the point of the whole thing? Because there is no point to the whole thing. And Nozick says this. He says, once a person starts to think their life is, you know, I forget the exact quote, but it's pointless, you know, they're, 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 there's just nothing you can do. That's correct. Um, and I think that often that is something, sort of this niggling worry in the background that people have that they can't really articulate. And I think that's what I'm articulating. Not always. Sometimes they're talking about something within their life. Uh, it was pointless for me to work on this book because nothing happened with it. That's everyday meaning. But if you say, I got a book deal and it's like, eh, but what's the point of my whole life? That's ultimate meaning. And sometimes people do feel that way, I think. And some people feel that way all the time, like me. <laughs> okay, so um, before we turn to the, the, the next bit, which is the question of why we should be sad at this realization, I thought one question we haven't really dug into is what you mean by life. We've looked at meaning, ultimate meaning, um, and various other things. We haven't really looked at what you mean by life such that it is not something that could potentially um, be a source of um, ultimate meaning. So what, what, what is your model of what a, what a life is such, such that it is the kind of thing that cannot have ultimate meaning attached to it? So that's, that's a really good question, actually. Um, I think that when I say life, I mean that there is this, the agential project of running your life, choosing your ends. Uh, Course Guard makes this distinction between um, uh, most animals 
and, and moral agents, which is an animal can do intelligent things to achieve their ends, but most animals we don't think of as having the ability to set ends, reflect on their ends. Why am I doing this? Should I do this? That's an agential thing. And so when I say your life, I don't just mean the biological part. I mean the agential life you have, leading a life, running a life, putting forth effort to have your life make sense to you also. Those are the, that's what I mean by a life, this sort of meta project that you do of running or leading your life, which is different than a bacteria or even a rat that just lives. You don't just live, you lead your life. That's a lot of work. That work has nowhere to reach for a point. That's the ultimate meaning. And that's what I mean by life in that sense. I really should say leading a life, I think. I think that's clearer. Cool, thank you. So. Um... The, the next question, I suppose, you, you mentioned um, earlier on Nagel and Nozick as two people who've um, trodden a similar path towards this question of ultimate meaning. As I recall from your paper, in Nagel's case, he kind of reaches a similar conclusion to you um, and then says, oh, well, you know, who cares? Um, so why do you differ so much from Nagel there? Because your um, argument in your paper is that this is a, a, a realization or a truth that should have some kind of um, feeling-based impact on us. In other words, it should make us, as you say, very, very sad. But Nagel wasn't. What did Nagel miss? Yeah. Is he just sort of a temperamentally chirpy kind of a guy? Or um... Um, I do think he is missing something. And what I think he's missing I think what he's, he, he thinks he's talking about value in general, and that if we can't, like, he's making this comparison between knowledge and value. And he's like, at some point, our questions outstrip our answers, and fine, who cares? But I think that I am not, I don't give up on value. I am not a nihilist. I am a moral realist, actually. Um, and I think that um, I don't, so I, I think you can, and I think I don't think anyone's a nihilist. Everybody, everybody cares about their own feelings to some degree. Nobody wants somebody to poke their eyes out. Nobody wants their their children to suffer. So I, I don't. I think nihilism is fake. Um, some people don't think there's objective value, but nobody believes in no value. So that's a difference between what Nagel is sort of get what he thinks his argument leads to, um, and then he and so he just thinks that okay, you don't need this ultimate justification, and who cares? I'll tell you why you should care because your life is something that you put a lot of work into, and so consistent with the way you think about your other projects, wouldn't it be disappointing if the house you were building was never going to become a house? What's the point of your building? Your building is a lot of suffering and a lot of work and a lot of effort. I think you also put a lot of work and a lot of effort and a lot of suffering into running your life, into leading your life. And to find out that there's no purpose to it, of course you should be disappointed because it is the same kind of thing, these other everyday projects you do, where it would be very disappointing to find out that it's pointless. And so I think because it's work and you're doing it with this kind of, same, it's kind of has the same structure as your other projects and your other work and you suffer for it because life has includes a lot of suffering and running, so does running your life and you have your failures and it's like even your successes, it's like, eh. What's the point of that? And so I do think it's a mistake not to be sad about it because wouldn't it be a mistake, let's say, not to be sad that your house crumbled or that your, you know, or that your love for your children was unsuccessful? They didn't feel love. The same, you know, or the, it, or it turns out it wasn't a child; it was a simulation, and you put all your work into it and your love into it for nothing. And so you should. It just makes sense to be equally disappointed because you put a lot of work and suffering into your life as a whole. So um, leading your life. So I'm interested in the relationship between beliefs and feelings, because obviously mm -hmm. for philosophers, perhaps um, are especially more likely to believe that a certain belief warrants a certain feeling. But I, I can imagine that for a lot of people who they could believe what you say, but still feel um, relatively unmoved by it. I mean, something that comes to mind as a more contemporary or quite different, but a similar phenomenon is what's increasingly called climate anxiety. So the idea is that if you um, really take in and really understand what the science is telling us, you should, there is a sort of a, a warranted response, which should take the form of some kind of fear or 
um, anxiety. So, but on the other hand, a lot of people I think don't feel that they sort of go go around their day to day lives, um, and in many ways they think that the youth, for example, are a little bit um, they're kind of over egging it a little bit, so to speak, with all this talk of doom and, and climate anxiety. So I suppose I'm interested in this disjunction between a belief and a feeling and how, how are you, I mean, do you feel they should always be brought together? Like a belief should always have an appropriate feeling response or do you just feel it in this area, but you have certain areas yourself where you have a mismatch between belief and feeling? So I think that Generally speaking, a sad fact warrants a sad feeling. That's an appropriate emotional response. It doesn't mean that you have to be like sobbing every day, all day. That's a waste of your life, which, and you could have everyday meaning in it. And that can mean a lot to you. Um, when you're thinking about your example about climate anxiety, I would say you don't have to have anxiety, but it would be sort of not an, an apt response to say, I don't care, but you should care. You should have a feeling, a concern. It doesn't have to morph into sort of the jitters and the anxiety that takes over your life. But to just say like, that's a don't care. That's something wrong with you. You're not responding properly. It's not, it's not an appropriate response. Your facts should match the feelings. I mean, your feelings should match facts to some extent. Otherwise you're like a sociopath or something's like missing in your brain, right? Something odd is off with you. And so I think here too, in the same case, I don't think everybody's gonna be equally disturbed by this, but just to say like, well, that's a don't care. I think that's a very, inappropriate response. I actually, one of my friends would, said this to me when I was talking to her, but she's like, well, I don't care if my life is pointless because it's so much fun. And I'm like, <laughs> I guess for you, what about everyone else? Some people are suffering. And so I do mm -hmm. think that, um, and I think temperaments, all these things definitely come into play. And it's so, but I think that to go to the extreme, so maybe you don't have to be like very, very sad, but you should be sad. You're, you're working at something for no reason. And it's a hard thing. Um, and, and you also have to suffer for it. And so, yeah, I think I think there is something so kind of like you're missing a, an aspect of human agency um, to not be at all sad. And that is the sense in which I would say your feelings should match the facts, at least to some degree. Don't just go right by them. Thank but the you. very, so, very well, sad, I would say, is about <clears throat> being an agent. How much of an agent are you? Thank you. So I, I guess a, a related question, which maybe you've already touched on, but you may want to go into it a bit more. I saw a response. I mean, you, you mentioned a couple of responses. I read one of them by Nelson Cohen, who basically says, if you've just settled on a line of argument that will make others sad if they follow it, then why do you want them to follow it? Because, as I say in my response, I am not in the happiness business, right? Uh, so uh, this is not my, my goal in life is not to make people happy. If that was my goal, I probably would stop talking completely. Um, uh, I think that philosophy aims at truth and that truth has a value independent of happiness. Um, and so I certainly think that that is a adequate response to that question. I also have another response, which I touched on a little bit earlier, which is to me, it is, satisfying somehow to make sense of these worries that we have these 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 sort of bothering things that concern us it's like oh that's because it's ultimate meaning and i cannot have it so there is a i can't put it to rest but understanding it can give you a kind of peace with it and so that's sort of the emotional upside but like i'm not in this to make people happy so i just would say like yeah I, that's not my 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 aim here is not to to in, to increase happiness, but I also do think that for a lot of people to bury your head in the sand and pre, and pretend that you're not you don't have this problem doesn't work because you know you have this problem somewhere in you you know you have it and that's why on a bad day and sometimes on a good day sometimes on the best day you'll say that's kind of pointless. Thank you so much, Rivka. Um, so I'm going to open up the Q and A and I'm going to start from the top and um, we'll um, kind of take it from there really. So, I mean, the first one's a question to, to me, I suppose, will attendees be able to view a recording of today's event? If so, where will it be posted online? And the answer is um, as long as Rivka is happy to have the recording put online, it will go on our YouTube channel, um, which you can find easily enough. So- Make, make as many people as that as possible. <laughs> Um, so this is from David um, Collins, who says many of 
Professor Weinberg's definitions of meaning appear to appear to entail an evaluative component. As a contemplative, in brackets, meditator, I find an, quote, already there meaning in the miracle of living being, which is encountered and allowed when I effectively stop evaluating. Might she have a comment on that? So I'm not sure I'm fully understanding. Um, to say that there's a value to life itself, um, I think that you could you could make that argument. Nagel kind of makes that argument in, when he talks about death, where he says it's always a bad thing because experience itself is so good, just to be able to experience that it's always this positive thing. And if you're persuaded by that, or if that's how you feel, then I think that life itself can give you some everyday meaning, just being alive. But it can't be the reason for living, right? I mean, life itself is just a process. It's not a value. So it can't be a reason, or an, and it's also within your life, for, your, for running your life, life itself. It's no more a reason for living than, than a hut is a reason for building. Why do you want the hut? Is somebody going to live in it? Is it going to be beautiful? Right. So you can say that life is a value, but I don't think it's going to give you an ultimate meaning. Um, and you're going to also have to explain to me a little bit more of how it works. It's not as intuitive yeah, so, as like knowledge or beauty or truth. Yeah, so I, I think they, David's picking up on, I, I mean, I, there was a little su sub note. So he's linking it in with the Zen practice of, quote, non-thinking. So I, I, I suppose the perhaps what I see is the, the key question oh. in there is, is the mm -hmm. idea that isn't the problem with ultimate meaning the fact that when you step back from your activities and evaluate it, it's not there. But in the moment, yeah. the, the kind of like yeah. non-evaluative flow mm -hmm. of life, it's always there if you're looking out for it. But then it disappears as soon as you um, step back from it. So I think that if you're thinking about um, the sort of the Buddhist recommendation of living in the moment, um, if that's what he's getting at, I think that is a good way to reduce your suffering because you're not going to care so much about what comes before, or whatever you're not. Gonna, so you will have, you'll, you might be, you might suffer less, but I actually think you'll have less meaning, not more, which I, which is a different argument because I think that meaning, everyday meaning borrows from the past and looks forward to the future. So part of the meaning of, you know, looking into my newborn baby's eyes is I think of what brought me to that to that moment. And I think about what's going to follow from that moment. Otherwise you'd be living like somebody with severe amnesia. And it's hard to really think about having any meaning in that kind of constant present, which some versions of Zen Buddhism do recommend. And I think they recommend it as a way to reduce suffering. I think you will have less suffering, but you will also have less meaning. So I, in a certain way, I think, I argue this in, in later in the book, I think that suffering is a price you pay for meaning. Okay, thank you. So th this is a great question from Elka, um, bringing up a word that we haven't used, and I think we're probably all interested in knowing how it relates to your idea, is the idea of the absurd, which obviously we find in existentialist philosophers like Camus, but perhaps we also find it in a lot of different areas. I mean, it could even be a concept that's embraced by some of your colleagues in the analytic um, meaning in life tradition. So how does your discussion relate to or differ from the idea of the, the idea that life is in some way absurd? So absurdity occurs when sort of there's an incongruity, there's a mismatch between sort of what you're doing and what you're, you know, and what the point is or something like that, like wearing a, a you know, a clown suit to a, to a job interview or asking your dog what time it is. That's absurd. It, the the aim and you know and and the action just have no are at, are incongruous. They don't fit together. It's it's a poor fit. Um, Camus uses this notion when he says that our lives of, are absurd because we're reason seeking beings in a non reason giving world. There's this mismatch. It's an incongruity. Nagel disagrees with that. He's like, there's no world that would give us a reason. The absurdity occurs because we can step back from ourselves in thought and question, and we have that incongruity of perspectives. That's his version of absurdity. Um, I've written elsewhere, actually, I had an essay in the New York Times a long time ago about the absurdity of life being too short for our purposes, which makes it absurd. But more globally, and to the point that I make here, I think you could talk about thinking about absurdity as an incongruity, as a mismatch. The absurdity 
would be similar to Nagel, actually. The absurdity would be the seriousness with which we take our lives, the effort we put into leading them, and then the fact that, they, you know, as if they have a point, like the other projects we do that have points, but it doesn't have a point. So that's how I would apply absurd, the concept of absurd to what I'm saying here. That would be the incongruity or the mismatch. Okay, thank you. So this is um, um, from Jana, um, Jana Bacevic. Um, um, so Jana asks, in a situation where, say, a terminally ill patient is refusing food, would you say the meaning of their life or their life project is death? Wouldn't that lead to a paradox? And Jana notes, um, just to be clear, I don't think it would, but I'm curious to hear the answer. You might aim at dying, and that would be the aim of you're not eating food. But why would it be the point of your whole life? You did a lot of other things. You led your whole life. And so it wouldn't, the point of leading your life would not be to starve at the end. And what value is that, right? If remember that a, I, a point is a valued end. What is the valued end here that's being aimed at? And why is, and how does it connect to leading the entire life? So I think that the, the example shows something much more sort of every day. That person is starving for the purpose of ending their suffering right now. That's sort of an everyday meaning. That's the point. The value is to stop suffering and they're aiming at it by not eating. That's what they're doing. But that you can still say, well, why do you lead your whole life? What is the point of the way you led your whole life and the effort you put into leading and living your life you know, as this separate enterprise and meta project of its own? Thank you. So um, Michael Babbage touches on um, <clears throat> finitude, which is something you mentioned earlier about feeling that life was too short to fulfill a project. So his question is, how does the recognition and acceptance of our finitude fit into your picture of the impossibility of an ultimate meaning? So I don't think finitude is really the problem. Um, because I think if you live forever, you would have the same problem of ultimate meaning. It might even be more stark and worse because, and this has to do a little bit, I mentioned on the essay that you published today on death being overrated. I don't think, um, I don't think living forever, I don't think being finite causes this problem. And I don't think being infinite would solve this problem of ultimate meaning, because I think the problem of ultimate meaning is lies in the fact that our, that we have nowhere to reach outside of our lives for the point of lead, of the project of leading and living them. And so if we lived forever, we would just have a longer period, a bigger project with no point. Um, and so I don't think that, I think that finitude is a separate issue um, that has its good points maybe, and some of its disappointments. Um, like I said, I think the whole death is overrated. I don't think it makes life much more meaningful than people think or much less meaningful than some people argue. I don't think it does both either. But in terms of ultimate meaning, we can see that because the problem arises from the fact that your life includes its entirety, no matter how finite or infinite it is, leaving nowhere for you to reach for a point of lead for leading it, uh, being finite or infinite doesn't really affect the problem. Thank you. I, I like something you said in the death is overrated thing. You, you said um, death is not a problem for meaning. And there's of, of, often people say that oh, death is the um, the kind of phenomenon which helps make sense of meaning in life. And, and you say like death is kind of quite um, merciful. And it's actually time that is far more of a, an issue when it comes to the question of um, finding meaning in life. But that's maybe for another Another yeah. day. I don't want to... That's sort of where the book, the, the my last chapter in this book is where I talk about time uh, and what I call the time meaning conundrum, which is you need time in order to have meaning. I touched on this a little bit earlier, right? So that otherwise you're living like this amnesiac. You have to look to the past for meaning and the present and the future. It's the whole fullness of time that gives you meaning, but time also erodes meaning because everything, it chips away at the impact and the value and the significance of everything that you didn't achieve. And so, and it's uh, time that creates this conundrum and this problem, not death. Death doesn't do either one. It's time that does it. Um, and that, uh, and, and how long you live would have no effect on the problem of ultimate meaning because your life will still include your whole life. So um, this is a question from Anne Vroom who 
brings in the the question of religion, which I think is very interesting because, as I said earlier, I I would before I started reading your work, I would have probably thought if someone referred to ultimate meaning, they were meaning something like what you call cosmic meaning, but also, and I don't know if this is part of cosmic meaning in your book, kind of a, a, a religious meaning. So Anne's basically saying that if someone says, I live my life for the glory of God, is that not an ultimate meaning within your framework of analysis? So I suppose the question is how how might God, for some people, act as this um, arbiter of ultimate meaning? I think it's just a way of postponing the question, putting off the reckoning, actually, because the same way you can ask, and I actually did have this conversation with my sister as I was leaving our religious upbringing. And she said to me, well, what's the point of life without God? And I said, what's the point of life with God? It just, it's sort of, okay, well, what's the point of God's glory? You can ask the next question. When you have this afterlife or this supernatural part of your life, it just, you just can still ask, what's the point of the supernatural part? What's the point of the afterlife? Um, and you also have the problem of living for God's purpose. That gives God a meaning maybe, but not... That's God's meaning. What's your meaning? What's your ultimate meaning? So um, so that's sort of another problem. It's not yours. But the deeper problem is it just puts it off. You want to know what is the point of the glory of God? That's why it's used a word like glory, because glory is vague. What is glory? And why do you want it? And why are you what are you going to do with it? Right? All these visions of the afterlife. It's like, what are you doing there? Why do you want to do it? It's just as pointless as a regular life. It's just sort of supernaturally mysterious. Um, but I don't think, and this is something I, that I will talk about in in uh, when I discuss cosmic value uh, or cosmic meaning, um, I don't see how God so can solve the ultimate value problem, the ultimate meaning problem, because you can just as well ask that those questions about living and basking in God's glory, living for the glory of God. Why? What's the point of that? It just gives you the next question. Thank you. So um, Charlie Tabin brings up a name that I, I think has probably been on a lot of people's uh, minds during this conversation, um, Arthur Schopenhauer, and was just wondering if Schopenhauer has influenced you at all or how you may describe your views relative to Schopenhauer. I think Schopenhauer um, talks a lot. Some of the things that I am certainly influenced by Schopenhauer and some of the uh, ideas of Schopenhauer that I find most compelling are really about the value of life and how awful it is. You know, when you think about, uh, you know, Schopenhauer says, think about uh, a predator eating prey. Who is having the, you know, is it is it worse for a predator, to, you know, to have to be hungry or worse for the prey to be eaten? Like the whole thing is terrible. That life is just uh, is just a bunch of pointless suffering. Um, and in that sense, I really do connect with Schopenhauer. I think Schopenhauer um, was arguing a little bit even more extremely that life doesn't even have everyday meaning and value. Really, that, that like that, I think oh, I would say that Schopenhauer was saying that life doesn't have everyday value. And I think he goes a little too far in that direction. I think life can have a lot of everyday meaning and value. Um, and maybe Schopenhauer could have had some too if he wasn't such a dick. Um, <laughs> maybe he would have had some friends uh, or or a girlfriend or a boyfriend or whatever uh, would have tickled his fancy. Um, uh, but I think he was more focused on ultimate pointlessness and also how much pointless suffering there is in life, which is also true. And so those are the aspects of Schopenhauer that I think have influenced me a lot. Okay, super. So we're heading towards the end. This may be the last question we'll we'll see. So this is from um, Bill, um, who's asking about your idea of of a life as something one leads. Um, so Bill asks about um, people who just live their life without making a project of it, and what you say about this possibility. I mean, do you, do you think it is um, kind of indistinguishable from the project of a life that it is led, I, I suppose, is Bill's conundrum. I, I think that some people lead their lives more as independent projects and efforts, more so than others. Some people are more goal-oriented than others and are thinking about their life as this whole project or this whole enterprise or this whole effort that they're leading more than others. So I think this can come in degrees, but I also think it's part of being a human moral agent. And so everybody makes their choices. Like we talked, like I mentioned earlier, are you gonna, are you gonna 
uh, have a committed relationship? Are you going to have a hard job or an easy job? Not, maybe you don't have that choice. Sometimes some things happen without choices, but you do make some choices along the way, thinking about your life and the kind of life you want to lead. And so I do think it is inevitable that everybody does it. And to the extent that you don't, I think it's kind of a loss of human potential. This is part of what makes uh, a, a, the value in life also, right, is, is being an agent. And so you're kind of wasting your potential. And so your life will be less tragic, but you'll also be like less human. You want to live like, you know, you don't want to live like a rock or a potato. You want to live like a cat. Um, actually, there's, what's his name? John Gray. Somebody wrote a book about how you should live like a cat and you'll have less suffering. And it's like the Buddhist. You'll have less suffering, but then you're going to be a cat. You're going to also have less meaning. What about your knowledge? What about the deep love? What about, yeah, you'll have a lot of suffering. So that goes together. But in terms of being a moral agent, a, 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 a human agent, I think part of being a person is leading a life. Um, and that has its value, a lot of value, a lot of everyday value and a cost, which is you're also doing this other pointless thing. Okay, great answer. Thank you. So I think we'll end it with this question from um, Brianna who brings in another thing who I haven't actually thought about in relation to our discussion, but is definitely a, a really interesting person, that's Spinoza. So Brianna asks about um, whether the kind of sadness that you're um, talking to would be seen by Spinoza as a result of um, what he would call inadequate ideas. So in other words, a, a not fully worked out picture. Um, the idea being, as I take it in Spinoza, that once you've really kind of grasped what it's all about, you're kind of in this state of beatitude that presumably wouldn't involve feeling sad about falling short in some sense. Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, I have, I don't fully understand Spinoza and I tried. Um, so maybe the fault, it, so my answer might just be missing the point. Um, but I think, look, this is what I think is great about philosophy. I mean, if there's no high, like, like a met like an intellectual discovery like you figured it out even figuring out that life was pointless felt really good <laughs> um, uh, in a certain way but i don't think it i don't think it's a i don't think that feeling is all there is to it you're still gonna do the next thing i don't think you can it's sort of similar to like you're gonna bask in the glory of god for what for how long what's the point of that um and so i think spinoza's ideal, if I'm understanding it correctly, of sort of basking in the glory of your intellectual achievements, I don't think that's going to give your life uh, a point. 